Paul Lyander with you on this Thursday morning, the final Thursday of March. The madness is continuing. Insta.gram Hill here on the ones and twos, as always, for you as we get rolling into a significant sports weekend. Not the fun, fantastic, ever present college basketball weekend we had last weekend. It's about the night times, but it is about staying up late tonight for Carolina fans. And that's where we start here. We missed opportunities all week to do so, so we're playing catch-up today. Heads Carolina, tails in California. And if you flip the coin between these two teams, North Carolina and Alabama, which is the late game tonight, which you'll be able to hear on Buzz Sports Radio throughout the triangle, it is even money. Apparently, there are some extra bets coming in on Alabama and Vegas, which we're not sure about, but it is expected to be the highest-scoring basketball game of the weekend with a total points of 173 and a half that is 20 points more than any other of the sweet 16 matchups that we are seeing they're expecting offense in this one and very little defense i'm not sure if that's going to hold up to be honest alabama though does put up a ton of points carolina alabama is the second half of the doubleheader today we're just doing education this morning Carolina, the second half of the doubleheader. The first game happens to involve another ACC team with Clemson and Arizona. We all know what could await us on Saturday, but you got to play each game one at a time. Armando Baycott spoke to the media yesterday. It was media day for the teams in Los Angeles, the city of Angels, the city that never sleeps on the west side of the United States. He says, yeah, maybe a little chip for UNC as they represent the Atlantic Coast Conference? It's a lot of stuff that goes into it. I think most ACC programs are playing a high-level conference, non-conference schedule too, so I think that really plays a factor. And I feel like another conference might not be as strong or they're kind of manipulating it in a way in some sense. And I mean, this year was definitely crazy because you look at how great NC State has been playing, how great Duke has been playing. But Clemson too has been great. But I mean, you look at teams like Pitt who's beaten three or four of those teams that I just named, and also, too, um, UVA, they obviously got out. But I think this year was a lot of ACT, ACC teams that were deserving that didn't get a chance to make it. And hopefully, I think everyone sees just after this year, like how competitive ACC basketball is and how good the teams are. Insert Pitt's name into the chat. Da, 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 da. Full politician mode for the Atlantic Coast Conference. Armando Baycott, not even talking about himself, really. Talking about the conference as a whole – putting four teams in the Sweet 16. So beat your chest. Thump your chest. Do what you need to do. 25% of the NCAA tournament. Come on now. Hey, ACC represent? That's fine. All good. But Carolina is not all of the ACC. They are playing not an ACC team tonight. They're playing an SEC team, Alabama, that is run by a backcourt that has a 6'11 center who is the spitting image of Armando Baycott in the post, except he's a white dude. That's the only difference right now outside of the fact that Baycott has a ton of skill, too. I mean, Baycott, I mean, let's be honest. Armani Baycott. But there is someone that's going to match up against him. There is no size difference. They're not going to throw a bunch of smaller 6'7", six, 6'8", six, guys at Armani Baycott. There is one guy who is going to guard him, and he plays an all-around game. And their backcourt is legitimate. R.J. Davis talked about Bama playing their style. I mean, I think they did a good job of kind of just playing their brand of basketball. I mean, they're known for uh, transition threes, and um, they rely on threes and layups and dunks. So, um, But they did a good job of kind of just um, playing their defense, corralling the paint, being in the gaps, and kind of just turning the ball over. There's a lot of up and down, so um, that's what we're expecting for tomorrow's game. It could be that way, complete up and down, which is why, which is why that total is so high. As I mentioned, the Tide have a backcourt. Mark Sears, Aaron Estrada. If one goes, the other goes as well. Estrada is more of the all-around guy in terms of rebounds and assists. Sears, though, is their leading scorer, and he can stroke it from anywhere, and he shoots nearly 44% from three. So they're going to shoot, and they're going to run, and they're going to gun. And Carolina fans, be aware of this situation to where it was frustrating for you to look back and watch them just sag off of Elliott Cadeau. At the three-point line, not a threat if they can get Cadeau the ball, and if he can find success from the three, it'll take some of that away. They won't be able to sag on him and move back on defense and give double-team Baycott in the post 
or make sure that they're not able to flip around and go catch Harrison on the wing before he hits those threes that he's been known to hit from time to time, especially against Michigan State. Cadeau's going to have to go. Like, that's the – that that Cadeau on the go, right? Cadeau on the go. Get him rolling. That'll free up a little bit of that low post, so Alabama will have to force itself into transition. Grant Nelson will guard – Armando Baycott. Grant Nelson is 6'11". He's a strong guy in the post. He gets boards. He puts up points. He shoots at a high clip. There is, in the starting five of this Crimson Tide team, they also shoot free throws really well. This is not Wagner. And definitely not Michigan State. Michigan State let North Carolina do what they do what they want to do at will in the second half of that game. Alabama's a much more well-rounded team. Out of the SEC, they were only one game out of winning the championship in terms of the regular season. They're legit. They will come at you in all different directions. Paul Eihander, Graham Hill here. This is also the first meeting between the two teams since, and Carolina fans should remember this, whenever these two teams meet, uh, it's fireworks, offensive. I mean, there's a reason why the over-under set and the total is. That's because last season, Alabama defeated North Carolina 103-101 to in a quadruple overtime thriller, which saw Marcus Sears score 24 points, go 8 of 13 from the field. So these two teams, I mean, if if you like offensive battles, you're in for a treat tonight. Can Carolina hold up against a run-and-gun style team? Have we seen it? Have we seen it happen with this basketball club? That's going to be the one thing. If And we know that R.J. Davis can keep up. We know that Seth Trimble and Spots can keep up as well. I just mentioned Elliot Cadeau. Cormac um, Ryan, even. How that could go. Ryan, but Ryan's been a little bit streaky here in the postseason. I'm not trying to downplay the efforts of the Carolina basketball team. I'm not. I'm trying to prepare you for the battle that is about to ensue tonight. I do not think this is a wide open, some team's going to win by 9, 10, 12. I think that's the analysis that you're seeing. I think that's what's popping up in everyone's heads, too. I'm not even worried about the travel aspect. They've been out there. They know how to win. Not concerned about that. But having to get in an up-and-down game with a team, Alabama scored 100 points multiple times this season, and those happened in, in, in... in crazy wins at Charleston. They ran it up against Charleston, but you know Alabama's not going to play a ton of D, but they're going to try to do what they can to stop somebody. I don't know who it's going to be. But if Carolina can avoid a little bit of that up and down, and if they do have to get in that up and down, then you're just going to feed Davis and let Davis get his 21-plus and see what happens there. It will be interesting. Not a lot of up and down running teams in the ACC. This is a different style of test. We know that they can hang with the big kids. That's undeniable. The wins will come. And in the tournament, it's not about, as we mentioned yesterday, survive in advance. It's about just get the job done. And with Armando Baycott's answer about the ACC, and it felt like politicking, it, it feels this feels, again, like that business trip style play for Carolina. Yeah. We are going there to win. That is our goal. Not worried about some of the outside stuff. Yes, they've got, they got some puffy questions about Uh, sports betting, and whatnot. But it feels like they're just dialed in. They're aiming to return to the Elite Eight for the fourth time since 2016. That's that's the focus. I tell you, Paul, what's also going to be really fun is the guard matchup between Mark Sears and R.J. Davis. That's going to be a show, with Sears being one of the nation's most gifted scorers, averaging 21.5 points per game. And then R.J. Davis, ACC Player of the Year, Naismith, uh, Player Contender. It's going to be a good one tonight. Nate Oates talked about Carolina and the high praise he had for the Heels. Click, click, click. I mean, North Carolina's one of the best teams in the country. Number one seed, deservedly so. They got a lot of talented guys. I mean, we've got our hands full. Our defense is going to have to be a lot better than it's been most of the year. I thought thought we had a good defensive game against Grand Canyon. Our offense. Wasn't very good. We're going to need both of them together uh, playing well to be able to beat North Carolina. But I, I do like where our guys' heads are at. I'm not sure if it's about team defense as it is about individual defense for Alabama to stop Carolina. Again, they, they put up a ridiculous number of points, but their opponents also do the same thing. Yeah. In their losses, they give up, they give up 90s. <laughs> they give up 90s. 
and they're still putting up an 80s and 90s kind of scoring. It's gonna ha- they're going to have to key on a one guy. I'm not sure if Davis is the guy they're going to want to key in on. It's going to it's going to have to be somebody else. Again, Cadeau can erase some of that by just hitting one three tonight. Sure, just hit one or Cormac Ryan. Ryan, if he could get on a heater from the corners because he loves those corners and that and that wing spot, then all then it's all hands on deck. I'm not sure Alabama can keep up with that style of an offense. They will. Th- this will be a as obvious as it sounds, but it won't be because there's depth to it. Alabama will have to outscore North Carolina if they just cannot solve some of the offensive like question marks that Carolina poses to them. They're going to try to dictate and make Carolina decide how to play on the offensive end. I mean, they're a great I mean, they can get steals, deflections, they're a great rebounding team and even coach Davis said from a defensive tam- standpoint, they're a tremendous team just from the athletic standpoint on defense. Grand Canyon had studs on their team and they dictated pace against Alabama and held their own up against Alabama pretty much until about the last three to four minutes of that basketball game. Carolina can dictate pace as well, but it's going to take a couple, it's going to take some shots and it's going to, they're going to have to make a couple of plays to make Alabama think just a little bit more. And that will get Carolina win and an advance to late Saturday night. Yeah, it's a late night, folks. A late night with a 940 tip. So get a nap in today if you can. I'm Graham Hill with three things you need to know right now from 999 The Fan. Duke signee Cooper Flagg won the Gatorade Boys Basketball Player of the Year Award on Wednesday. Former Duke and current Orlando Magic player Paolo Bancaro surprised Flagg with the announcement on Tuesday afternoon in front of Flagg's family, high school coaches, and teammates. NCAA President Charlie Baker on Wednesday urged lawmakers in states with legal wagering on sports events to ban betting on individual player performances. Prop bets allow gamblers to wager on statistics as a player accumulates them during the game. The Carolina Panthers are adding a former number one overall pick to its defense this offseason pass rusher. Jadavion Clowney is coming to Charlotte, the team announced on Wednesday. NFL Network insider Ian Rappaport is reporting it's a two-year, $20 million deal for Clowney with a max value of $24 million. Find these stories and more on WRLSportsFan.com. Tonight is a Carolina Hurricanes game night, hockey night in Carolina, back at PNC Center. A little bit later of a start. Boy, this is going to be a long night for folks. 7.30 puck drop as your Carolina Hurricanes take on the Detroit Red Wings, who find themselves, and I hate when these teams come to town because they come scratching and they come clawing, two points out of the final playoff spot. Just two points. Head coach Rod Brindamore talked about getting his team ready for the playoffs yesterday. Well, your details on little things, but you're not trying to push too hard. Um, but you know, you gotta still try to get better. And so, we, you know, it's the video sessions are really where you're getting better, better. But then running the reps on things that we got to do. Again, we still have a couple of new guys that really haven't had any of those. So um, that's really more. A lot of it's for them, but it's also refreshers for our guys. We gotta continue to find a way to get better it's in game reps graham focus on details been, right right they've been getting in game reps throughout the entire month of march like there are no there have been some practice reps and saw some of the photos come out yesterday of rod talking to to Svetch. hopefully that's to avoid us having to put a plate on the penalty box at pnc the andre Svechnikov <laughs> memorial penalty box yes thank you um uh, <laughs> it's funny but it's not uh this team has been getting all its reps on the ice for the entire month of March. This month is very similar to December, in which they had a 15-game schedule. But in December, they were sub-500. Remember, they went through that rough stretch right around Christmas, and then they came back and uh, ran a few things in a row. It was that Islanders game, and I happened to be at that Islanders game. 5-4 overtime loss? Yeah, that was, yep. a, that was tough. It just felt like they were trading blows with the Islanders, who, you know, at that point were – not necessarily figuring themselves out, but found themselves in contention. Since then, they have slipped backwards, and they're also on the outside looking in. The Canes this time, 
depending on what happens in these last two games they played tonight and again on Saturday. This has been like two on, two off, two on, two off, two on, two off, a couple back to backs. All the in, all they've all come in game, but the good news is they would finish at least on the plus side when it came to the record because they're already eight and five with a couple with an overtime winner uh, earlier. So for this Canes team to get to dial in on those details and to get Jake Gansell and Evgeny Kuznetsov completely into the fold. Again, these have been in-game reps for this hockey team. There hasn't been a lot of time. I mean, it's just film study, right? Film study on ice. This is where you need to be. This is how things slide. It's up to the leadership of this team to get them up to speed. Now, they're professional hockey players, right? They come with expectations, especially considering who they are. With great power comes great responsibility. With Jake Gensel, a name like that, with Evgeny Kuznetsov, both of their pedigrees, they have Stanley Cup rings, they know what it's like to play in the postseason, it's up to them to get up to speed just as much as it is for the team to get them moving. They all see the clock ticking. They all know how many games are left. We remind you because it's part of our gig. But I promise you, they have whiteboards in their house and they have mantras written in that locker room and you can only use so many expletives to get yourself moving. Because to move up and to get rolling through these standings means to start winning hockey games. Boston has helped with a loss. Florida helps with losing as well. They have to keep losing. The Canes do have some meetings with the Bruins. They have two left this season. And the Rangers are doing what the Rangers do, which is win hockey games. And they have won three in a row. And they're trying to give themselves some distance and provide some momentum as well. Rod was asked about the health of a couple of guys. Ness is just, yeah, he wasn't feeling 100%. Um, Quickie, I think, is right around the corner. Whether he plays tomorrow or not, I'm not sure. But definitely, you know, it's within the next game or so, I would assume. To pull back from the nicknames, Martin Natchez, uh, feeling alone in the weather. Quickie, Jesper Faust, who's been dealing with an upper body, uh, has been sitting for a while, but because of that, they haven't had to make the full, complete lineup adjustments that you would think they would have had to make with Kuznetsov bat with Kuznetsov in a center role and Gensel on a winger role, trying to figure out where they go. There is going to be an extra man who's going to have to sit. That question may have already been answered within the organization. We have not seen it on the ice as of this point. Perhaps not even tonight uh, for the Canes, uh, depending on who they end up rolling out of the lines, Graham. Are we at that point of the season, Paul, where about, what, 10 games remain until the playoffs? Nine. Nine games remaining? Oh, wow. Where, where is the time going? Yep, single digits. Nine games remaining. We're at that point where maybe some of these guys, like, as you just mentioned, Natchez, just seeing how he feels, Foss, depending on, you know, the status of the injury, just sit guys for well, these last nine there's games. A, there's a luxury in doing that, but there's also a luxury in knowing that you've secured home ice advantage, at least in the first round of the playoffs which they haven't done. Now, the likelihood of it happening is is high. Let's put that one out there. It's not not some big question mark, uh, but it does require winning some hockey games. It does require getting things back on track after what happened in Pittsburgh, which was kind of a meh, right? It was kind of a Coming meh. Coming out flat, yeah. Yeah, it was a meh for everybody. It wasn't that they – it wasn't that, you know, g- the goalie play was terrible. What, it, you know, the opportunities were there, you know, but they were, they were hitting uh, Nijelkovic square in the pads. Like he didn't have, he wasn't challenged that hard. Orlov's goal was, you know, a complete. The definition of a one timer was a one timer. No one gave him the puck. He just went, cheek, cheek, there it was. Like, and those things happen. Sebastian Ajo's uh, goal uh, the other night, you know, off the skates, you know, that stuff like that just happens. You have games like this. You can chalk them up to just kind of meh. It just happens. But you also need to secure your bag going into the conference playoffs, and the Hurricanes haven't done that yet. And they will tonight face a scrappy Red Wings team and uh, welcome back one Shane Gostisbehere, who <laughs> leads that team in assists, if you can believe that. Can't wait for him to score a goal tonight because well, that just seems to be the theme and he's a former Hurricanes player who comes to PNC Arena. He knows. I mean, he knows what's coming. Uh, it will be uh, tonight in goal Alex Lyon for... The Red Wings, who has played uh, the the heavy lift, but he gives up a lot of goals. He gives up three goals a game against this team. Former Hurricanes goaltender, right? I, am, am I mistaken? 
I want to say yes. Fat check me, Adam Gold, if you're listening in right now. Yeah, just shoot him, shoot him a text. He'll know right away. We'll we'll mention it in the next segment. Red Wings again, scratching and clawing, and the the Canes have the season advantage on this team. There's no doubt about it. Uh, to to not coin a phrase, come out fast, so to speak. <laughs> nice. This, and let's get Jake a goal. Like let's get Jake a goal goal. Like one of those. Let's get him a tic tac toe goal. The ones yeah. that the ones that you want to see. He doesn't have to be creative. I mean, that would be cool to get a creative goal too. But I think for the full embrace for us to wrap our arms around Jake Gensel, for him to get one of those goals, and I want to see Andre Kuznetsov do the skating thing again. Like early on when he first became a hurricane, and this seems so long ago, right? It seems like, you know, a, a decade ago, but it's only been a handful of games. For him to be able to be masterful with that puck effortlessly. It feels a little laborious right now. And again, team came out flat a couple nights ago. And I hate saying it is what it is because it's a lazy phrase, but it is what it is. And one more thing. Andre Svechikov, who's set to play in his 400th career NHL game for the Hurricanes, that. don't play it in the box. Like, actually actually play. Skate on the ice. Don't don't spend it sitting two minutes in the box. I hear cursing in Russian across uh, the triangle right now. Just He's like, what's that guy say? Damn it. Go, do I'm Patrick. sorry, Andre. You know what? I love you. I, that's I'm what just it saying. Takes. That's what I'm that's saying. That's what it but... takes. Light him up. Three three goals tonight. Hat trick. I'd like to see a hat trick tonight, too. Right? I want to see everything. Shut out goal. Shut out performance. Whatever. You know where we're going with this. Canes fans lean in. Hockey night in Carolina right here. 99.9 The Fan. 7 o'clock pregame with Stormwatch Adam Gold. And puck drop at 730.